Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. I hope you're staying dry if you're based in South Florida. Uh, my name is Dan Gretsch, um, and this is the BizHack Live uh, Masterclass Series. Um, I'm having a little trouble on my side sharing my screen. Uh, so Brett Searcy, would you mind sharing the slides on your side? Yeah, give me one sec. Perfect. Um, I wanna welcome you guys to our fourth and final masterclass uh, on Mar uh, business for Web3 in the metaverse. Today, we're gonna be focusing on um, case studies of how to do business in the metaverse with uh, folks from three different industry verticals. One is higher education, uh, that's Dr. Musina Morris or Dr. Mom. We have travel and hospitality with Tommy Farr and B2B sales with Nick Romero, Romero, uh, Romeo. Um, just to give you guys a reminder of the journey that we've been on in the, in the metaverse in Web3, season six has consisted first uh, of marketing in the metaverse, how brands are rewriting the rules of marketing. Uh, that was three weeks ago. Two weeks ago, we did the financial and legal landscape of Web3 and blockchain. Last week, we did an extraordinary session about engaging and recruiting employees and talent using the metaverse. And today uh, is the culmination of it all. We're going to actually show you three live, robust examples of how work by businesses and educational institutions is happening today in the metaverse. And we're gonna bring you to the cutting edge of the most um, important new technologies in social media. Uh, my name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the host of this four sessions, the CEO and founder of BizHack. I have a background in journalism and, uh, and media, and I bring that to my work uh, as a fractional CMO services provider, helping businesses develop their marketing strategy. Uh, my partner in crime and producer of this series is Brett Searcy, Chief Digital Officer of Starmark. You know, I got to say, Brett, I have worked at NPR, at PBS. I started one of Miami's first podcasts. I've worked my entire career with professional producers, and I would take you in a minute. Uh, this is, and I, I really am saying that from the bottom of my heart. Like, one of the great joys of my professional career has been producing this series with you. You are phenomenal. And one of the reasons why is because the guy is a principal at one of the top digital marketing and cutting edge marketing firms. He is a deep subject matter expert uh, and he has been in this industry for 20 plus years. He also it has an incredible visual design sense and an incredible sense of story. And so we are, are, are producing each of these sessions like their little stories um, and with beginnings, a middle and an end. And this is the the culminating final chapter, the, the denouement, the, the series finale, if you will. And so uh, strap in guys, hang on to your seats. Uh, we are just getting started. Now, here's the good news. I wanna bring Danilo, uh, our partner in, in on this. This is really just the beginning, uh, isn't it Danilo, of uh, you know, more seasons to come. Yes, thank you, Dan. I just wanna just reach out to everybody and say, thank you for being here. It's an honor to be with you all. And uh, please stay safe uh, during this time and keep our, you know, our neighbors to the north in your prayers. Um, they're going to be going through a very difficult time. Uh, they're going through it right now. So um, please, uh, if you need assistance or anything like that, you know, you can always reach out to me at uh, Danilo.Vargas at MiamiDade.gov. Um, so please uh, stay safe. That, what you said is perfect, Dan. First of all, I want to congratulate you and the team and Brad and Tiffany. Just a fantastic season six. I've been blown away. I leave. After today's class, I am sure with a clear uh, understanding of what Web3 really is and the opportunities and tangible things that we can start doing today and also the metaverse as well. And um, <clears throat> like you said, Strike 305 is only getting started. These digital marketing masterclasses with BizHack are only going to get better and better. And we're going to be launching a bunch of new things in the coming months. So please stay tuned. We want you to make sure that you guys are all master marketers when it's all said and done so that you can take your business to another level and this is one of the ways that we've done it and i'm just really proud of the work that dan and his team have been able to do on behalf of small business owners so uh back to you dan thank you all so much you know i i wanna um i wanna just say that we're gonna have big announcements about uh the growth of our partnership with strive 305 
uh, in the coming months. But I do feel safe to announce this. Uh, this is season six of the Masterclass the Master series, and there will be a season seven. I'm very happy to announce. And that series is going to be just in time for your annual planning. We're going to be doing a series of sessions about strategy, about communication strategy, marketing strategy, and business strategy, so that you can go into 2023 poised for growth. I can tell you the one thing that makes a difference between a successful company and a company that's treading water is if it has a really solid strategy. And so uh, you as the business owner, that is your job to set that strategy. And now is the time to get started with 2023 planning. Um, I wanted to also recognize our great media partner, South Florida PBS, Go South Florida PBS. I was actually part of an Emmy nominated documentary with them and they're part of the public radio, public media family. And we also have an extraordinary group of community partners who have helped promote this to their members. A lot of you came to us through them. Uh, these are chambers of commerce and other organizations that are dedicated to helping small and medium-sized businesses thrive. Okay, enough. Now it's time to talk about the incredible uh, group that we have. I would like uh, to start, uh, Tiffany, if you could please launch a poll. We'd like to know where each of you guys are in your metaverse journey. Are you totally new to the metaverse? Kind of just trying to get your feet wet. Are you a noob? as they say, um, are you just getting started uh, doing your research, but it's been something that you've been kind of interested in now for a bit, and you're kind of doing your preliminary research, you're not totally new to it. Uh, are you ready to build? Do you plan to test and learn in the metaverse in the coming year? Are you already testing the waters? In other words, are you already doing something with blockchain or crypto or the metaverse in 2022 in this year? And then in the deep end, have you already gone full throttle with the metaverse? Um, the, just to give you a sense, the, our three panelists today are in the deep end. In the deep end, <laughs> lost in the metaverse, deep in the hole, whatever you want to say, these guys are like in it to win it. Uh, in fact, um, our we're going to be featuring uh, three amazing guests. Uh, uh, first is, uh, I, I can't even call you uh, Dr. Messina Morris because I know your name is Dr. Mom. Um, which it, when you meet her, you'll immediately see uh, mom stands for molder of minds. And uh, as such, uh, Dr. Mom, you were just recognized right now today with an award. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Can you tell and us? Last, <laughs> it's been a good season of award, of award giving and uh, recognition for Morehouse in the Metaverse. So really proud. Yeah. So Dr. Mom. Uh, started from a very modest project to building an entire camp campus of Morehouse College, an all-black, uh, all-male school, historically black school. And the Dan Danilo is part of the diversity and inclusion office of the mayor. Um, anyone who lives in South Florida for half a minute knows we have one of the most diverse populations. And part of what we're going to talk about with Dr. Mom is the metaverse and the meta world that was built by these black men. Uh, and we are so excited to hear more about that. Um, our next guest, uh, so we're gonna kind of go with three case studies in this order. Just so you know, we're definitely gonna run over time. So if you're able to stay with us till 2 p.m. Eastern, great. Uh, but we have just too much to talk about to be able to fit within the strictures of an hour. So I just wanna give you all a heads up. Go ahead and reschedule your 1.30s so you can stick around. Next is Tommy Farr, founder of Metaverse Hospitality and Consulting Group. Tommy is gonna share, share with us real world examples of hotels in the metaverse. We're gonna actually see one of those hotels. Um, he's, he's built various hotels. This is a, an incredibly interesting example of real estate in the virtual world. And then finally, uh, but not last but not least, um, Nicholas Rome uh, Romeo from Boggy Creek Airport Boat, Boat Adventures. Um, one of the cool things uh, that Nick did is he actually launched a new um, attraction at Boggy Creek in the metaverse first. And we're going to talk about why he did that, how he did that, and then it was a butterfly pavilion, and then how that um, promotional uh, element has driven real world attendance at the actual exhibit once it was actually physically built. But this is, this is an incredible opportunity, right? Like, instead of having like, you know, a, 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 like a little sculpture of like a 3D rendering of what's to come and then just lots of construction tape. 
You know, if you're Star Wars in, uh, if you're Disney and you're building out your Star Wars, you build it out in the metaverse first, people can start getting excited about it, exploring and experiencing it. You might even learn about things that you should do in the real world as it's being built. Just the possibilities are incredible for the entertainment industry. And you're gonna get a very concrete example of that um, Starmark built uh, that metaverse experience for them. So we're gonna be talking to Brett about the work he did in partnership, partnership with Nick at Boggy Creek to build out that butterfly pavilion. Couple things, we always get the same questions. So please stop whatever you're doing and just listen to me to say these things. Here are some things you can expect from us. Number one, yes, this is being recorded. And yes, you can watch the recording. And that recording will be on our YouTube channel within 24 hours for both BizHack and Starmark. And we'll send you a follow-up email with a link to it. So yes, it's recorded. Enjoy this, share it. Um, don't feel like you have to take notes. This is going to be a lasting resource for you, courtesy of the mayor's office and Starmark. Second, now that we're at the end of our four, we're going to be sending you a summary of key takeaways via email as a thank you for being here. So the Starmark and BizHack teams are hard at work, basically pulling and extracting all the usable information, all the practical tips that we can from this series into a single uh, takeaway that you can use as a resource if you are in that totally noob or just getting started or ready to build a stage uh, of your business. These are gonna be concrete things you can do today to start building out for Web3 in the metaverse. And then finally, if you're interested in our strategy masterclasses season seven, you're automatically enrolled for those. You're gonna be getting uh, emails from us, uh, letting you know about that uh, a little closer to the date. It'll start in November. Um, and you can also invite others to, to join our masterclass series using that link. All right, so today's webinar is called Case Studies of How to Do Business Using Web3 and the Metaverse. And I wanna, as always, first do a little definition of terms because we're not assuming, we're assuming most of you are noobs uh, and that you don't know what Web3 means, what the Metaverse means, what an NFT is, what blockchain is, et cetera. So, um, so uh, over to you, um, sure. Brad. Do you want to do you want to close out the poll, or uh, do you want me to run through a quick description? Yeah, yeah go ahead and close the poll. All right. So uh, for those of you who haven't been able to attend the first few sessions, you know uh, that I'll give you a quick uh, update and overview. And those of you who did, this might be a little repetitive, but um, we're going to show you how we're going to tie this all together today. So some of the terms we'll be using will be like the words metaverse and Web three, and and so. Um, Metaverse uh, is similar to the, the term internet. There's only one internet and there's only one metaverse. And that will be ultimately when it does exist, which it doesn't really today, it'll be the interconnection of many different meta worlds or meta properties, meta locations. Just like you can link lots of different internet websites together on the internet, these websites all can cross connect and interlink. Web3 just re really refers to the third version or third iteration of the, of the internet. The first one was really built about building websites. And where the, the largest company and the smallest company could kind of be on equal footing, they could put their presence out there and they could have these websites to help promote their business. Web 2 was really geared and built around social media and uh, the interconnectivity of us as users, because websites were very much, uh, you know, push, push data. Uh, social media allowed a lot of connections and interactions. However, social media is typically all owned by the large conglomerate companies like uh, Facebook, as an example. And what Web3 is doing is it's really decentralizing that information. Instead of a company is owning all of your information, you will be able to own your information and you will be able to control who has access to that information. And it also allows for um, direct connection and direct commerce. So this is kind of the third revolution of the internet, so to speak. And that's what really Web3, when, we, when you hear that term or phrase, that's what we're referring to there. So... You'll hear the term Web3, you'll hear the term Metaverse, Meta World, Meta Property. That, and uh, today we have three um, great case studies that would all be, um, you know, Meta meta Worlds or Meta Properties or possibly a Metaversity as well. Perfect. And um, just see if I can... There's my green screen. Um, so I want to welcome up Dr. Mom to start. And... <laughs> Um, you know, the pandemic hit almost two years ago, uh, Dr. Mom, and um, I'd like you to just talk about how Morehouse College um, got started 
with experimenting with the metaverse as a way to teach your students. Awesome. Thank you everyone for having me. So proud and, and just happy to share what we've done at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, and grateful to be able to just expand the minds of others because that's what I do as Mulder of mine. We started in the summer of 2020 with our high school students doing asynchronous virtual reality during the pandemic. So I am the science research coordinator of a program called Upward Bound Math Science, where we bring in first generation college students to have a residential college experience and to get more insight into STEM fields. Well, we know that our students could not come physically to campus because we were in the height of the pandemic at the time, but we didn't want to pause the programming because our students come from the freshman all the way through their senior year for this type of experience. So once they're in the program, they're continued and followed all the way through their matriculation in college even. So we wanted to make sure that we still had access and um, reach with our students. And we developed a virtual reality course. So we hired Victory XR, who are our educational partners to come and um, help us explore asynchronous virtual learning for our students that was tethered to the next generation science standards. They loved it. And we knew we had something. So we pitched this virtual reality experience to our then provost, Dr. Michael Hodge. And they had a synchronous learning campus that Victory XR wanted us to explore. And myself and three other professors uh, who were innovators in our, our disciplines anyway, decided that we take a look. So they shipped us our MetaQuest at the time, just the Quest headsets, the Oculus Quest headsets. And we experienced what teaching and learning could look like in a virtual world in the fall of 2020 and immediately said yes. There were some challenges and some opportunities that lied ahead, but we knew that this was the type of engagement that our students needed because kids all over were forced into technology in a two-dimensional way, which made it really challenging for them to continue to matriculate through their disciplines. And we wanted to make sure that our graduation rate was protected, that students were matriculating through their disciplines and were engaged in the content too. And so we decided, hey, let's do a proof of concept of what a virtual reality college campus could be. And we started with the academics in history, biology, chemistry, and English. I wanted to acknowledge, you know, I'm on the Dean's Advisory Board of FIU's College of Arts, uh, Architecture and Communications. And I wanted to acknowledge uh, Dean Schreiner and Susan Jacobson and a number of members of their team. Uh, they have this incredible volumetric studio called the iStar Studio. So, uh -huh. so I've been very uh, joyously for the last decade working with them as they enter into these advanced technologies. Um, one, one of the things that I know they're going to be curious about is you ended up getting some funding for this yep. from what's now called Meta, uh, formerly known as Facebook. Would you mind just giving a very quick summary, if you can share, of how much you got and how you got it? Because uh, um, I think that that has really helped accelerate your efforts, has it not? It, it has. So this is the thing, though. They didn't start um, funding us when we did our proof of concept, actually our largest donor at the time was Southern Company and Qualcomm. So we wrote a proof of concept paper before Meta even got involved and knew that we were really doing this and using their products. We were funded by um, Qualcomm. Qualcomm sent out all of the headsets, but you know they make the chips for the headsets, right? And, um, and Southern Company was interested in how we could change the way that we educate um, the future. So they they were our largest funders to begin the project. And then- um, Sorry to interrupt, but how did you even have relationships with Qualcomm and Southern Company to be able to raise that money? Or was that done by one of your development people? Our provost really was sold on the idea. And with knowing that we were able to follow through on it as professors. So we're academicians, right? Like we're a part of the academy. And one of the things that we do well as professors is research. And so we leveraged the capabilities that we had to be able to write grants. 
to get this funded. But we've been doing that, at, especially at HBCUs, for a long time. In order for a new program to move forward, we leverage the power of our ability to write grants and to do research to be able to fund our projects outside of what our institution can. And so this project was grant funded from the beginning. And we leveraged that power and had the support of academic affairs to be able to move it forward. So it's not a matter of having those initial relationships. It's knowing that those companies are, are interested in future and tech and education and knowing how to actually source what you need. So we just knew that some yeah. company was in the business of trying to fund different types of futuristic educational initiatives. That's and, great. And then, you know, obviously Meta jumped on the bandwagon. So um, let's talk about the actual, um, uh, go ahead, Brett, and show the video. Um, there's no soundtrack to this, but I want you guys to see what a Meta world built by young Black men looks like. Um, and um, you'll, you'll see that obviously this is led by Dr. Mom, uh, you know, so this is, there's obviously a, a um, you know, some female presence here, but if I'm not mistaken, in all these images, any any women you see are professors, is that right? Like right. those two women on top? Okay. And, so and that's so me and Dr. Tanya Clark and then Dr. Odell Hamilton and Dr. Ethel Vereen. We were the inaugural professors teaching in the metaverse space. And this is my chemistry class, learning how to uh, understand molecular geometry in space. Uh, these are students going through the digestive system, looking at inflamed tissues, uh, looking through heart valves, teleporting through the reproductive system. So <laughs> a men's health course was our first course. And so we had students who were non-STEM majors that were first year students who took that course. Dr. Ovell Hamilton is teaching a general education world history course, um, reenacting battles on the battlefield. Uh, this is a cross-disciplinary lesson between English and chemistry that we were taught uh, teaching. But students were able to do, this is their favorite, the magic school bus, go through labyrinth experiences for assessment purposes. Um, so, you know, you didn't get the answer right, you got crushed. <laughs> so we kind of gamified some of their assessments and um, it just turned out to be an amazing way to engage our young men. And we started to see student achievement increase by 11.9%. We started to see student attendance rates for class even increased by 10 percentage points. We saw students were not withdrawing from the classes at all. Whereas in Zoom classes, they were they were withdrawing, right? So we saw increases across the board. And we compared this in our face-to-face -face model of like just our traditional residential um, experiences, our online experiences where we were on Zoom or whatever other um, meeting platform. And then in our metaversity model and we saw gains and we knew that, wow, we have something here and we should continue to spread this across more disciplines and do more with our students. And then the idea of, oh, it's more than just academics. Let's do some other co-curricular um, and other types of student experiences kind of took off from there. Yeah, I had a couple questions. So one is, to what extent did the visual identity that the men chose to give to themselves resemble their physical identity or did they completely reinvent their look online and the men? So over? it was a little bit of both and there was some controversy and some challenges around identity that we decided instead of just saying it was problematic that we started to put out information about how avatar experiences actually matter. So we have a professor, Dr. Monique Earl Lewis, who is our department chair in Africana Studies, who began to explore how students showed up in their presence as African Americans. So looking at the culturally appropriate, uh, culturally appropriate avatar creation and how that changes the experience and what that really means and how important it is for students to show up as themselves and be able to choose characteristics of their own features that are native to them, right? So do you, do you have any examples of, of where there was a point of friction? Oh yes, yeah. she decided not to join the program and she's a rock star. 
So she decided in our first cohort when we were bringing in, um, so we had first cohort, then the second cohort that was coming in the fall. And she is over our Apple Code and Create project. And so she's already real technologically sound and she does a lot of great work at the college. And we were really excited to bring her on. But when she went into this space, because she's also a psychologist, she was like, this doesn't resemble me. I don't look like myself. I look like um, an ashen version of myself. Um, my hairstyle is not the same, the texture of my hair and just who I am, it's just, it's not appealing. And so it was a turnoff for her to be able to teach African-American experience, the introduction to African Africana studies in this kind of space, because the reality was it didn't feel authentic. And so she went on, I was able to convince her to come back in to the project and change the narrative. So how can we reshape the narrative where our students do feel like they're represented? Now, I can tell you what made me say is I stayed a part of the program for several reasons. I taught chemistry. In chemistry, you can't see the molecular world. It's really important for our students to be able to have a grasp of the molecular world that they can be able to work in their field and persist in STEM fields when it becomes challenging and a little more complex. So I started off teaching advanced and organic chemistry in that course in, 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 in virtual reality. And that really changed how my students visualize themselves being able to do very complex chemistry because they were able to visually see it. They were able to manipulate the molecule right. into different ways. So yeah, and we and we saw that. And I, one of the things I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to make sure there's time to get to everything. One of the things that I saw, you know, is the physical like, you know, I remember I grew up um, and went to the Franklin Institute and there's this giant heart in the Franklin Institute. It was like my favorite thing. And you could walk through the ventricle and you could see the flow of blood. What I just saw is the Franklin Institute, but for anyone, you don't have to be in Philadelphia to do it. And then, you know, the other thing uh, that you said, which is, is so she built, uh, Dr. Mom built this in the Engage Meta World, uh, right. in the Engage platform. Um, and we're going to talk more in the third part, in the third case study about what Engage is. And uh, it's kind of, uh, according to Brett, the most business friendly of the various meta worlds. And um, yeah. one thing I did want to ask, um, you know, there's been a lot of controversy uh, with facial recognition in terms of recognizing black skin, black features, um, you know, Zoom, uh, you know, black complexions don't come across as well as, as lighter complexions, black hair. Um, so there is an embedded you know, bias and racism built into these platforms because they generally are built by white people. Um, right. So um, it sounds like you're, you know, coming, confronting, you know, the, the, some of the embedded uh, racism in this brand new technology already. Yes, because our student voices matter and they're, what our young men always bring is the culture. They always define what the culture is and they, need to have the technical aptitude also to be able to develop worlds that they want to inhabit and that reflect the world that they see. So we were real intentional about helping them develop culturally responsive spaces, making sure that they will have culturally appropriate avatars, making sure the face enabling software where they were able to scan in their own faces, that they appeared as themselves. And so I've showed them ways in which they can do that. But I've also appealed to Engage and to Victory XR and other companies that we've worked with to make sure that that is priority so that we can have diverse voices be heard and that we the experiences that people have are true to what they're experiencing in the real world. And if we have more of our young men that are able to be developers and develop these worlds, then they can have a place in shaping what we are trying to define as a new world and bring us closer together because we're all experiencing the same thing as human beings. And we all want to be represented in a way that is our best self. And so if I can bring them to building the table, then they'll be able to do that for not just themselves, but others. And yeah. so it's an all inclusive environment. You know, this is what inclusion means in Web3 and the metaverse. And it means you have to fight right? It's not fair or right that, that you have to fight to be looking to have a look that is honors your physical self. 
Um, but bravo to you, to your your partner, uh, your your colleague, for, for voicing this, and bravo to you to to encouraging her to engage. Um, and one of the things that happened is you've changed the platform. Engage yeah. now does have more inclusive representation. In answer to your question, Maggie uh, Maggie Farley, about how they resolved this issue, it's they got uh, they got in touch with the developers and they prioritized um, the better representation of brown and black skin and hair. Uh, yeah. And it's probably not quite where it needs to be, but it's better than where it started because of you guys. Yes, and I'm and I'm proud to say that you know that my colleague did speak up and that I did continue to bring her in and say, okay, well we'll just wait instead of waiting. You know, I tell everyone join in, like join in because people don't know what they don't know. If it's not their experience, then a lot of things they just don't know to to do but we've got to let them know. And we can't be afraid of having differences of opinions or different perspectives on how we have lived our lives. We've got to give everyone an opportunity and a chance to engage on a very human level yeah. so that we can solve the complex issues that lie ahead. So and, it's, and it's not necessary to have these conversations. Brett, if you could pull up that slide with the statistics once more, there, there's actually something really remarkable embedded in those stats. First of all, um, when you look at the um, when you look at the student attendance number, attendance is improved online and even better on the metaversity than it is brick and mortar. Now that that makes sense, right? You have traffic, you have driving, you have cars, you have you know late from work, you have your kids. Like there are all these things that might stop uh, you know a college student from making it to class on time. Um, right. It's the next one that really got me, which is student engagement decreases online. Anybody who's taught during the you know, everybody's got their screens off, they're, they're non-responsive, you know, they're probably, some of them are embarrassed about their home situation. Uh, some of them, um, you know, there's, there's really good reasons, in other words, their screens are off, not always uh, disengagement. But the bottom line is, look what the metaversity does to online education. It yeah. takes something that was a weakness and turns it into a strength. Students are more engaged in the metaverse. And I think that's why this representation issue is so important, because if you feel like your avatar really is an extension of yourself in a way that honors you, then you're going to be more engaged. And then the, the technology itself is just so in, engrossing for any of us who've been lucky enough to experiencing that it actually is an improvement uh, on the brick and mortar. That to me, it should be incredibly exciting if I were an educator. It is. It is. And that's the thing that really drives us to continue to build this out in different disciplines and try to reach more students because of the engagement piece. That means that students are really taking ownership and feel like they have autonomy in this space and they're not afraid to show up. So I've had students that have had different learning challenges and issues. I had a student named John who had a horrible speech impediment, but when he presented in, as his avatar present, flawless, diction and speech and was able to go through all of the complexities of the chemistry when he was doing his presentation and he told me afterwards he felt so much more at ease and comfortable in that space and he was like I don't know you know when I'm anxious and when I'm in front of people I kind of seem like I don't know what I'm talking about because my speech impediment just you know as anxious as I get it just gets worse and then he was like but in this virtual experience that I was having, like, I felt so comfortable talking to you all. And I felt like you all saw me differently, right? And I saw myself differently. I saw myself as competent because I showed up in my lab coat or I was in my astronaut suit. So I was capable and able so they can see themselves and in their STEM discipline doing the work. And then it just builds on their confidence. And so their aptitude to do the work increases and their willingness to want to even go the extra mile to find out how to engage in their, their discipline is, has increased. So it's yeah. been a wonderful experience. And, and, and you shared with me that this wasn't the only surprise. Uh, you know, the, 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 the young men took it and they made it their own. They started meditation Mondays, fitness classes, yep. a candle in the dark gala, and an independent 2 a.m. study hall among themselves. Yes. Uh, what were what were like the biggest like when you tell this story to your grandkids or your great grandkids and you're telling them about how Dr. Mom 
you know, innovated the metaverse back in the day at Morehouse College with these young men. What story do you think you'll tell about the, this journey so far? What example will you tell them about? What, what, what student? So I think the most telling uh, part of it is how we built community. We built community at a time where people were really feeling very isolated and challenged with connecting with one another. And we did something very special at Morehouse. We gave people a voice and opportunity to feel like they had um, ownership over their own life and that they could chart their own path. I call that opportunistic reality. And I did it because humanity could not wait. Humanity can't wait still for us to continue on this journey and to make sure that we are educating young minds about this technology and the powerful tools that it can provide to make our lives easier and to make us more connected. So the one thing that I think is most valuable is the sense of community. We brought all stakeholders to the table. So it wasn't just students and faculty. Staff members have been involved and are involved. We've had alumni that have gone out and gotten headsets. We have non-traditional students who are on our Morehouse online program getting an opportunity to experience campus life at Morehouse because we have a digital twin that they can spawn on and then experience all of the things. So I, I think that for me, the most proud moment of this entire experience is how we created community in the metaverse and kept everyone connected at a time when everyone felt isolated from one another. Thank you so much. That was really beautiful. We're going to um, move now on to Tommy, but I do want you to stick around and uh, hopefully mm -hmm. we'll have a chance to bring you back into the conversation. So, so Tommy uh, has built three hotels in the metaverse, and I wanted to, to start uh, by showing you one of those hotels. It's called Euphoria. Uh, and Tommy, maybe you could walk us through. This is one of the hotels that you built, um, and it was specifically built um, for uh, a kind of a younger and hipper set. Uh, the other hotels you built, one was a business uh, for business people with a conference center, and the third was uh, a vacation kind of hotel experience on a tropical beach. Yeah, yeah. So each hotel we're building is going to offer a little bit something else. Um, this one you're showing right now is built in Sandbox, um, where we have two hotels built currently. Uh, and like you said, it's, uh, it's centered to a little bit more hip, party-centered, a hotel that's going to have, you know, a DJ on the rooftop, uh, a very Partridge centered uh, DJ and pool party place on the rooftop, casino in the hotel. Uh, <clears throat> just a, uh, a fun hotel with lots of games. Um, and yeah, here it is. It's just a gallery downstairs. room. It's actually a sensory inclusion room. So this is their room that they rent it out. This will be our residence. So this is a piece of real estate in the metaverse. Um, which meta world was it built in? So that is Sandbox. Uh, it, it is the more pixelated style and there are some limitations to that, of course. And, you know, we do see the metaverse more like Ready Player One in the long run, um, where, where, you know, it is yourself in the immersive experience. Um, but for now, you know, this is where there is opportunity in, in both real estate and opportunities to you know be the first hotel in that type of metaverse uh, it's one of the popular yeah. ones it's one of the ones that pretty much everyone entering the web three world is jumping into place two to start really and um one of the one things of the that things i want to say is you know could you just explain how the mechanics of the business model works so so you can either rent or buy a room in the hotel is that right or you can 
um, and then rent it out to others in the secondary market? You want to just explain just how you make money and then where it's physically located? Where is Euphoria f physically located in the sandbox meta world? Where, what, like what street is it on? Yeah, for sure. So uh, how we release this Genesis collection is it's NFTs actually that connects back to these three hotels hotels that uh, we built, two in Sandbox, one in the NFT worlds. And there's two tiers, a resident tier and a guest tier. Um, there are very few residents per hotel, uh, but if you get a resident NFT, you own that room and then you get to build out however you like it. Um, when renting rooms comes into play, it's these residents that own the rooms. It's their opportunity to rent it out um, for residual. I um, mean, we have not had our grand opening yet, uh, so we are going to, you know, wait until these residents decide how they want to build it out exactly what they want to do with their room. That's how we're going to, um, you know, from of, uh, having these NFTs to tie back to the rooms and then the guest NFTs are tied back to different amenities throughout the hotel. Um, so there's conference rooms for, you know, events like this that can be held in the metaverse. Um, there's larger event space for, for people in on that. There's a, a golf course that you can jump after your meeting and get a little golf in, in the metaverse. Um, there's restaurants and dinings and bars throughout each hotel. Um, that partnerships are going to come into play, retail partnerships as well. Um, there's lots of different opportunities within partnerships within each hotel. Um, and like we discussed before, each one offers a little bit uh, different style to uh, connect with different audience. So we've talked about Sandbox, right, which is one of the meta worlds you can build in. We talked about the Engage meta world, which is where Dr. Mom has operated. It's more of a you know, realistic at looking avatar versus the boxier one. And then you mentioned in passing the Microsoft owned Minecraft world. Um, could, could you, what was the name of that one again? I missed a little, little bit of the question, but it seemed like to expand on the metaverse. Um, we do have two in sandbox and one in NFT worlds. Um, NFT worlds is where we're within Web3 and NFTs. Uh, that's just it's not true regulations. And right after we finished Minecraft, which is the server it was built on, actually banned NFTs. Uh, so NFT worlds had to do a complete pivot um, off of Minecraft. Um, and now they're, they're building their own. Um, so it's a just a little bit delay, you know, and everything in the metaverse and in the web the world is technology is quite there it's to the point where uh, the good team is they're ready to to re uh, establish themselves as a top of the land um i have land right next to the board yacht club which has established someone as the, the the biggest brands in web3 at the more moment um and another piece of land right next to artifact which was actually bought by nike um they were the ones that created the first digital shoes and you know, these digital shoes are selling like crazy amounts of money um, and they've kind of expanded that brand to bring all types of digital um, wearables to the metaverse. Yeah, you know, guys, I just want to acknowledge um, that Tommy's in Tampa right now and he's experiencing a little bit of weather, which is why it's kind of co coming in and out. Uh, Tommy, it's amazing that you're here today. Um, just so you know, you're kind of coming in and out a little bit for us. I did have one little quick question for you. So what he, what he said, if you guys caught it, was that... Um, one of the meta worlds uh, that he built in uh, had its rules changed by Microsoft, its corporate owner, uh, and NFTs were no longer allowed to kind of integrate into the meta world experience. What that essentially meant is his business model wasn't going to work anymore, right? Because remember, he's selling NFTs that are the equivalent of ownership of rooms in his meta hotels. And so uh, I wanted you to talk about the risks inherent in building in such an immature platform and the fact that sometimes you make big investments and then the carpet gets pulled out from under you. I wanted to just kind of get your perspective as a businessman, as an entrepreneur, and as an early adopter in the, the, the opportunities, but also the risks inherent with building in such an immature space. 
Oh, for sure. There, there's huge obstacles, you know, huge risk, you know, knew that from the start. Um, and, and we have to, you know, plan to, for the future if that happens. And the way to do that is diversify. Uh, we're ready to build in many, many metaverse. We just started with these three. Um, you know, for example, we're ready in the other side, which is the Board Ape Dot Club metaverse um, that is doing test date. Um, you know, every quarter about that all you have to do is be a part of to start building in. Um, so there's different ways to prepare for the future uh, while being ready to diversify, I would say is the best way to look at that. Um, because yeah, there's going to be things that come up, whether it's by law or, you know, a team just not not making it, you know, for the long run. It's, it's going to be like, you know, it's called Web3 for a reason. It's the new iteration, like they said, of the internet. Web1, not everyone made it. You know, not Amazon wasn't Amazon until a lot long way down the future. You know, things are going to change weekly, monthly, yearly. I uh, just got to prepare for it. Absolutely. Um, you know, we're in the in in the meta. If we're in Web three, we're at the Web one. You know, website version of Alta Vista. You know, we haven't Google hasn't even been invented yet, right? Um, rarely in, in Web one and Web two. Right. Facebook was not the first, you know, major platform, but they did end up winning. Oftentimes the winners uh, come later. And so there is definitely a version of Web3 where there is not a single meta world that's currently in action that will survive. That 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 meta world is yet to be built. Um, and so just as you guys are thinking about your investments, you know, what you're really doing is you're building out capabilities in how to do business in the metaverse, as opposed to really making bets on any individual platform, uh, because the, it's going to shake out in ways that we can't even expect. And you know, Google uh, was going up against when it was building out its search. You know, some of the most established companies in the world, uh, Microsoft included, and won. And so, whether we see new companies that emerge. Um, and become, you know, the largest companies in the world, uh, or companies that are, um, you know, funded by the Metas and the Apples and the um, Amazons and the and the and the Facebooks of the world. Uh, you know, whether they're going to win. W one thing that we have ch generally seen in Web One and Web Two is the incumbents tend to not be the winners. In other words, it, the, of the big five, it would not be surprising, even though Meta changed its name, uh, Facebook changed its name to Meta, it would not be surprising if the winners in the metaverse don't even exist yet. Because uh, that has been the trend in web one and web two. So we'll see is the bottom line and you have to be ready to, 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 to pivot. So I'm gonna ask you a personal question, Tommy, and if you don't wanna answer, don't. But how much money do you think you lost or wasted by building in a metaverse that didn't allow you to actually use NFTs in the end? You know, we'll see. Uh, it's something that we're, we're not just going to put to the side because the, the resort was built. You know, we each resort in the metaverse is a little bit different based off which team you go off of, where it is, how big it is, all these things. But it, I'm telling you, it's at least 10000 for per hotel you put in um, in USD. You know, everything's in Ethereum. You have to transfer to ETH and whatnot. But you know, it's not cheap to, to build a hotel in the metaverse. First off, you have to buy the land. First off, you have to design it. Um, second off, you have to have the contractor that's going to build it still. You know, it's very, very similar to a regular build, um, just not physical. Uh, you know, so there, there's definitely losses in it. But, you know, something that made me build on it in the first place was the team behind it. You know, and they didn't just quit, which is, you know, it's not a true loss, which is uh, because they are working towards a, a solution. Um, but, you know, it's a lot of lost hope. Um, it's a lot of things that slow down the process of what we are working on and, and long term losses are even more than just that, you know, small amount put up for for the build. Um, and like you were saying with uh, the new players to come in and whatnot, but it's also the big players that are building the infrastructure in the background without making huge noise yet. You know, for example, Starbucks and Disney just had Web3 announcements. Um, you know, I know the people that have been working with Starbucks and Disney for months and months and months now on their Web3 infrastructure. Uh, and, and it's just now uh, being to the place where they feel comfortable releasing it. You know, it's same with Hilton, same with Marriott, same with the big players in hospitality. They're working on it in the background. 
you know, Hilton's been having uh, virtual reality training sessions with their uh, employees and their staff members for over a year now. Uh, you know, Marriott's released so their first NFT at Art Basel last year, which people may not know. They've been working on this, you know, since then. Uh, you know, the next iteration uh, of the hotel and hospitality scene is is having those these hotels enter uh, the metaverse through their concierges. You know, be able to have your concierge team sell your resort based off of you know, the exact same duplicate of the resorts in the metaverse. You know, be able to see these Hawaii beaches and uh, the escapes you can do on a on a tour uh, in the metaverse verse versus you know actually having to talk on the phone or look at the pictures in the internet um it's just the new wave of of the internet really the new wave of marketing different opportunities absolutely you know um thank you tommy you know for everything thank you for joining us in the midst of a a, a tropical storm a hurricane um you know and we wish you and, and your family and, and everyone uh, the best as you weather this you know living in in miami we, we're with you 100 percent and really appreciate you making uh, the time to, to honor this commitment. We, we value you very much. I wanted to um, also Thank go you. ahead and read the chat. Uh, Dr. Mom has got a lot of really nice things to say about you. Um, but one of the things that she used, a phrase that I wanted to, to pull the thread on as we talk uh, uh, you know, uh, about our next uh, case study is um, this idea of falling forward, right? So Meta, Facebook is, falling forward. Um, and Tommy, in a sense, is falling forward. What, th what this means is, you know, the risk, of course, is falling flat on your face, but you're leaning in to the new technology and you're taking risks uh, and you're betting the farm uh, on it, you know, working out for you. And it's, it's a high risk, high reward kind of thing. Um, and Facebook did it in web two. Let's see if they can't do it in web three. Um, and I, I think some of us are just built to fall forward, right? Some of us have the internal fortitude to be able to be in the, you know, uh, the cutting edge of a new technology and are willing to fall flat on their face. Um, this next example is a, is a third beautiful example of, of falling forward. Um, and I wanted to start by uh, showing the video uh, of the Butterfly Pavilion, uh, a butterfly pavilion that is part of uh, Boggy Creek, uh, but that is not actually quite yet uh, available to the world. So, so um, basically, you know, this is an example um, of a company that wanted to create a virtual experience of a new attraction before the actual attraction was ready. Uh, to allow people to experience it, uh, to test uh, how, how it was going to work uh, and how popular it would be, and to begin to kind of tease and promote its actual grand opening. So um, with that, go ahead and uh, play the video and uh, would love to, uh, to welcome Tucked Nick. away in a corner of real Florida is the start of something special. The headwaters of the world-famous Everglades. For over 25 years, Boggy Creek Airboat Adventures have introduced visitors to these pristine waterways, transporting them to a forgotten world of swamp dragons and Native American culture. Out on the Kissimmee Waterway, a fleet of US Coast Guard approved airboats provide guests with a true bucket list experience. Master captains share a deep appreciation for this natural wonder which just teems with aquatic plants, native birds, and lots of other scaly residents. Back on dry land, families just love the gem and fossil mining. Check out the on-site baby gator pond. Enjoy some boggy bottom barbecue. There's large pavilions to rent for private parties. And don't miss the up-close and colorful encounters in the new butterfly house. Sunset is truly spectacular out on the water. It's a cooler time of day when the wildlife comes out to feed and the photo ops are amazing. It's an experience not to be missed. Perfect. So welcome, Nick. Hi, guys. 
So I would love for, um, when, it, when does the Butterfly uh, House uh, actually open? So it actually opened on Friday of last week. Oh, okay. Congratulations. And, and um, I feel bad because we put over 350 butterflies in on Friday and we are in Kissimmee and we just are just letting them go through the storm. So um, it's killing us, but, you know, we'll be reopened again on Friday, hopefully, fingers crossed, otherwise by Saturday, because we're dealing with the same storm, um, just smaller gauge, because they just told us it's going to be a one hitting Orlando Kissimmee area. So um, our butterflies uh, event was amazing. Um, it is doing an incredible job. And um, I'm excited to show a little bit about what we did with the VR at trade shows, but we're open. We're open to the public. It's twice the size we thought it was going to be, and it's amazing. It's 60 feet long by 20 feet wide, and it's going to house probably about 400 butterflies every 10 days. And so when did you open the butterfly house in the metaverse? So we started it in um, June, was the first time we used it, and that was at IPW, which is a huge trade and travel show that was actually based in Orlando this year. Um, so we did it, uh, we had about 50 appointments, and we had the opportunity to show it off with a few of those appointments. Um, but it's not just showing it off here, it's showing it off around the world. Uh, uh, when Brett had told me and showed me what this was capable of doing and we showed it to the owner of the attraction she's like we could show this to every place that we market to around the world um once he explained it to us and that's what we're doing um boggy creek about in the high season does about 75 percent of our business is european travelers so we do about 150,000 people a year at the park um we're a small woman-owned business for the last 28 years um but we try to get our information out more than just an airboat company that's why we added this we have a huge operation in europe we have a, a rep that's out there that handles about nine of our accounts and we're like well how do we get information out to them after COVID? you know we're back open what have we done different and um brett from star mark had said you know nick we're doing this stuff why don't we try to do something with you guys? And she just fell in love with it. So we could actually sit in my office here in Orlando and someone with a VR in uh, England or Germany um, can become an avatar and I could walk them through the park, which they're selling to their tourists, deciding if they're coming to um, Kissimmee and they want to do something. And that has been a huge plus for us um, with doing that because we are dealing with some of their guest service staff that have never even had the opportunity to come here and see what we have. So yeah. this gives them a little bit more. So let, let me let me just kind of pull a thread here. So what we're talking about here, guys, is B2B sales, all right? So um, this is uh, more of an experience that was built to help travel agents in Europe, where most of their tra traffic comes from, want to put this on the itineraries of their clients. Now, typically back in the day, you would you know, charter a jet and fly these people over and house them for three days and wine and dine them um, and you know, spend probably hundreds of thousands of dollars a year um, bringing these travel agents here so that they would recommend you to their guests. And I'm sure you still do that. But this is a new tool because maybe some of those folks can't fly or don't want to fly or they, they you know, COVID doesn't allow them to fly. Um, maybe they don't want to be away from their family, even if it is expenses paid. And so now you can give them arguably a more engaging experience at a fraction of the cost once it's built. Um, so instead of investing in all the planes and all the hotel rooms, you're investing in the building, in this case, built by Starmark in the Engage platform of a meta world version of your new attraction to try to drive B2B sales, eventually getting more visitors to your center. Is that is that a good summary of what you've done? Absolutely, absolutely, Dan. And 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 um Tommy had 
really brought it in really well that um, Hilton and Disney are looking at doing this and the guest service concierge have that opportunity to do this for the guests. But yes, it's exactly there. We're a small mom pie attraction that took one huge leap, huge investment to really see how this works. And I have a lot of people exciting. I just did a show um, the receptive tour operator show in Orlando and I actually met with a, a rep from Colombia and in South America there the, the the way they sell is a little bit different they have a lot of travel agents that work from home that work for these companies and I could work with them with hundreds of people travel agents that'll never make it to the United States but they can now sell us to their um, their guests who are looking at doing something different in, in, when they're here on vacation so it's a huge um, opportunity for us to go forward. Um, have we had huge sales on it yet? We've just started it. So our goal is to, like my boss had said, she's like, that we need to go to the next level and see where we're going next with it. So, yeah, so this became part of a marketing, a B2B marketing and sales effort to try to get more buy-in and excitement from the travel agents that will ultimately drive more numbers, but you won't know if it worked because uh, you just opened and then a hurricane hit. So yeah, um, yeah. what we need to do is we need to invite you back six months or a year from now uh, and see how it went. Yeah, yeah. So let, and the, it, this is the big thing. Let me just say this damn quick is that, you know, people don't come to Kissimmee or Orlando for an airboat ride. They come for Disney. They come for the big four, Disney, Universal, SeaWorld, Legoland. You know, that's what they come for. I'm a second tier or third tier attraction, and I've got to entice them. And I have seven other airboat companies in Central Florida that I have to compete with. So how do I make it different? And this is one opportunity that I one step forward of, ahead of them. Yeah, I, I want to talk about that exactly. Like, let's get into the mind of a small, a small business, which is what you are. And you have a lot of choices about how you spend your marketing, very limited mm -hmm. marketing hours. And you chose to do this. Can you just talk me through like the decisioning that led to this choice? Well, you know, when we always do print, um, I own a magazine, also a tourist publication uh, separate from this. So um, we all do print. We all do our brochures. We all do our banner ads for things. And we're like, when, when Brett had showed us this and we looked at it, we're like, you know what, this is, we've got to be ahead of the eight ball. And this is going to give us that opportunity to be one step ahead of the competitors. No one's going to walk into the IPAW trade show with, with a VR headset and say, oh, you want to see our park? Come and sit with us, you know? And it blew them out of the way, the ones that did have the time to sit with us. That opportunity to take the next level, and yes, it was an investment, not saying it wasn't. It was, but in the long run, we feel that it's going to be a huge payoff once these people do that. And that's the thing that we want to look at. She always wants to be one step ahead of the owner. She always wants to be better than the next. Yeah, this is what we mean by falling forward, right? Yep, absolutely. So l let me ask you this, um, you know, and you, and you can, um, what percentage of your marketing budget was essentially um, dedicated to this campaign, this meta world but but butterfly pavilion campaign? So <laughs> this, she, actually, this was never even put in there. Um, my budget is not a huge budget. Um, marketing budgets to attractions are probably about 5% of our overall budget to the attraction. Um, so this is a very minuscule part of it, but it, it it's not a minuscule part of the whole budget. It's a big chunk out of my marketing budget. I would say it was probably about 10% uh, of my budget. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I would say- yeah, what you're seeing here, guys, is examples of early adopters, people who yep. are investing time and money, uh, risking falling forward, but immediately differentiating themselves from the competition and putting them in a position to be ready for Web3, which is inevitable and coming. 
Um, I wanted to actually bring Brett onto the uh, into the conversation because it was actually Brett's firm, Starmark, that built this technology. Um, and uh, Brett, do you want to talk a little bit about um, kind of the business case that you talked to uh, with Nick and with with your other um, clients uh, uh, for building in Web three when it's still such an incipient technology? Yeah, and, and so. It was really about trying to solve a, a business need or a business problem, right? It, it, 75% of their traffic comes from Europe. When the pandemic hit, that all ended. Uh, they could no longer give fam tours, uh, like you said, where they bring in the, 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 tr the tour operators who will book like six buses of people at a time. Like one tour operator could be a very important client uh, to Boggy Creek, right? They could no longer bring them in for these familiarization tours or fam tours. Um, and so it, it really became like, how do we get them excited about the new Butterfly Pavilion? And I, I really just showed Nick, I'm like, look, you can be here, they can be in Germany, they can be in London, and you just pop into your digital twin of your park and show them around like you would if you were there in person. I'm like, your conversation and sales pitch with them is really the same. It's just you're in a headset and they're in a headset and you're like, here's the here's the alligator pond and here's the, the barbecue. And then you saw that little video playing. One of Nick's uh, and uh, uh, concerns and the owner was like, you know, these people are really busy with, this can't take a really long time. They don't have, they, you know, they're like time starved. So um, we, we kind of did that two, a two minute or a three minute, I don't remember exactly scripted thing where they would sit in the boat and that little video would play and a sequence would go by. So alligators would pop up and little gems would fly by and the butterfly, because they're like, we need to keep this tight. This can't be like, like very long. And I think that worked out very well too. So you do this kind of scripted thing that gives a very high level overview. And then it's, Hey, you want me to show you more? And then literally you can quote, walk them around the, the park and show what it has to offer and answer their questions, just like you're there. Right, and then the other, so that's one use case. And then the other use case, of course, was as at the IPW travel show in Orlando in June as kind of an, act, an activation inside of their booth. Right, so, you know, they had to have a certain number of tickets for their staff members, you know, $1,000 to go or whatever. But then we just said, again, put a couple staff members back at the shop with headsets. And then in the booth, when someone puts a headset on, you have a staff member in the digital twin. They don't have to be at the show. They don't have to be in the booth with them, right? They can be remote and then they can sh change out shift every hour, every two hours and have different mm -hmm. people doing it. And so when someone puts the headset on in the booth, there's someone already in there. Hey, let me show you around, right? And then Nick can now talk to the next person in the booth in real life while someone is in the headset selling to the other guest who has the headset on. Yeah. So, and how did that work out, Nick? You got about 50 leads, right? Yeah, it worked really well. We actually had my, uh, my salesperson who books all my groups be at, actually she was home at her house doing it while we were at the show. Um, so that really helped us a lot. It's really weird. Next week, I have 20 reps coming in from Germany that visit Orlando is flying in to do site visits for parks. And I'm like, oh, I could have just done this in my <laughs> office and they could have stayed over there. <laughs> and I had to pay for them to come. And because I want them, I do want them. And I have to buy them lunch and I do that. They could have stayed home and had a sandwich. <laughs> and I could have done this, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so mean, um, it is, it's gonna, it has made a difference. Fantastic. So, so Brett, I want to talk a little bit about Starmark. Um, you know, we talked about how Starmark, um, this metaverse work represents about 1.5%, less than 2% of your total 20, 2022 billings. In other words, this is really a tiny part uh, of a very large pie of a very large and successful agency. And so I asked you, why are you bothering with this? Like, if this represents a lot of work, you know, you're here sponsoring and helping do this great series, educational series, but yet it represents less than 2% of your bookings this year. Why are you going so deep into the metaverse? Well, uh, I mean, I think it is the next great thing that everyone is going to be involved in. Um, there is, you know, a lot of hype around it and, and our, kind of our job is to cut through the hype and create real actual solutions like we did for Nick, right? And I love to hear um, 
the stories from Dr. Morris about how the kids used it to, and they did their own cultural things like building out a college campus, we think is super um, important, but we also feel like we want to make sure the kids kind of own it. We don't want it to seem like Big Brother built the campus and then they have to use it. That's not what this is about, right? And when we, you know, we built our first website in 1995 and our first commerce site in 1996, and that was before there were e-commerce engines out there. And then we ended up building, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of websites over the years. And I feel when Web2 came around, we ended up building all these social profiles for all of our clients. And now Web3 is here and we're going to be building out, you know, meta worlds for our, our clients in travel and hospitality. So it was really cool to hear about what Tommy's doing in the travel space and what's working and what's not. We're going to be building them up for our higher ed clients, for our B2B sales clients. I mean, all of these examples is, is when, they're, when you go beyond the hype and you're solving a real problem or a business need, then it's real. And that's what, you know, it's just like every Tommy said, he's investing, like we're investing. Um, I think, on, you know, last session I mentioned, we, we issued a headset to everybody at Starmark, um, but we did it for our own in, uh, reasons internally because to help maintain Starmark's culture when everybody went remote because of the pandemic, it was more of an inward facing motivation to do that. Um, but that the side effect of that is now everyone at Starmark is VR fluent. We can all talk about it with, you know, anybody and everybody, right? And so that's been a huge uh, uh, plus and benefit. Yeah, I think what a couple of things I hear that I wanted to pull the threads on. Number one, guys, this is a new tool, but you don't build a campaign around a tool. You use a tool to solve a problem. And this is my biggest pet peeve about marketing. People are like, how do I, what is my LinkedIn marketing strategy? What is my Twitter marketing strategy? What's my TikTok strategy? And then it's an immediate path to overwhelm. If you take a channel or platform-based approach to marketing, you're gonna overwhelm yourself. The, the, what you should do is you should say, who's my target audience? What problem am I trying to solve for them? And will this tool help me get there? And Nick is a beautiful example. Like those folks who were flying over to him from Germany, the kind of old fashioned way, they couldn't do that during COVID, but how did he reach them? How did he uh, promote to them? This was a tool that solved that problem. I like to say that marketing channels and marketing platforms are like a hammer. You can use a hammer to build a house or you can put a hole in the wall. It's all about how you use it. And that's really what Brett is, is doing is Brett is helping people use the hammer like a master architect. Now there's another thing, which is Clay Christensen uh, talked about the innovators dilemma. And here's the thing. You know, Starmark is one of the best and most established marketing agencies in South Florida, uh, among the biggest uh, and best in the country, and they are essentially disrupting themselves right now. This 1.5% is a disruption to their business model. They could go and continue to mint money, building websites in Web 1 and building social media experiences in Web 2, and they could leave the metaverse alone and all this time and attention and R&D that's going into figuring out how to build and engage and trying out all the different tech platforms, most of which won't exist in the end. Like all that is wasted time and effort, but no, they're choosing to fall forward. And the reason why is a simple business calculation, which is that if they don't disrupt themselves, someone will disrupt them for them. If they don't disrupt their own business model with what is coming and Web3 is coming and blockchain and the metaverse is coming, it's here. You have to be ready to disrupt yourself if you wanna stay alive in the new world. Otherwise, your time is limited, whether it's one year or 10 years or 15 years, your time is limited as a company and Brett's in it for the long game. So that is why Brett is investing far more than 1.5% of his resources and effort in a, 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 a profit line, that uh, an income line that we expect will grow massively in the coming years. Do you have a perspective on that, Brett? Do you have a perspective of what percentage of revenue it will be in 2023 and beyond? Not, not necessarily a percentage, but um, you know we have to we have to do experiments or small tests with all of our clients, and you know just you know no one's going to want to go in full bore, but they're going to want to do these small build outs and experiments, and then they're going to want to learn, and they're going to want to see what's working, right? And so you know, while we don't have a, a percent, we know that that more and more work is going to be coming in this area. I mean, there's there's no doubt about it. And when people uh, 
I think we've shown some really good examples in the last four uh, weeks in these sessions of people using it today to solve real business problems, right? And so we want to make sure that our clients who come to us and say, you know, we want to solve these real business world problems, then we want to make sure we're saying, yeah, the metaverse is appropriate or is not appropriate to help solve those problems. And we want to give the right solution, right? And so having this knowledge will allow us to apply where, where do we know this is working and where do we know this might not be working to, to these different industry segments. And uh, that's what's really exciting is, you know, every day is different and you learn something new and it's great. Yeah. Well, I wanted to um, first uh, thank all of our panelists for sharing their experience at falling forward. I, I love that term, Dr. Mom. I'm going to use it if, if I have permission. And I'm going to open it up now to some questions. I did want to start. Um, Tiffany, is one of us able to share the results of the poll? I'm curious where we landed on that. Um, I don't see the poll as an option for me to display, but I haven't seen the results yet. It should be shared now. Okay, great. So um, when we look at this group, about a quarter of you are newbies, uh, noobs, as they say. 46% um, uh, of you are in the research phase. Um, so that represents uh, about 70% uh, uh, of the group. And then the remaining 30%, um, a total of 11 of you, um, are in the ready to build, testing the waters and deep end stage. I would love if there's someone who's in the deep end, one of you guys three, one of the three of you who are in the deep end, if you could just um, do a shout out on the chat, I'd love to let us know what you're up to. Uh, same with the testing the waters crew. Uh, what are y'all doing uh, right now in, in the metaverse or in web three or in blockchain? Um, and while uh, we're doing that, um, I wanted to invite uh, Dr. Mom back on. Uh, so Dr. Mom, um, you have an amazing uh, story to tell about your son uh, who has autism and some of the work you're doing. Um, when we talk about diversity and inclusion, obviously we talk about skin color, race, uh, ethnicity, but we also talk about um, you know, cognitive and, and other uh, ailments. And so um, would you wanna talk a little bit about your work with your son and autism and the autism population? Yes, absolutely. So it is so necessary for us to be inclusive to our neurodivergent population. One in 44 young children live on the spectrum and one in 45 adults. And those are the numbers that the CDC has put out as of 2021. Um, so the statistics are significant. And what it's letting us know is that we have to be more inclusive in the way that we develop our workforce and develop jobs and positions, and not just education for the neurodivergent, but also that they have a place in the workforce and the capacity in which they can work and develop skills. And so what I'm trying to do is to create a neurodivergent learning institute for young people on the spectrum, all the way up through adulthood to transition into the workforce to have different vocational rehabilitation tools available to them where they can actually practice the skills that they need to be successful and to have gain, gain, gaining meaningful employment. So the thing about having autism is 85% of people on the spectrum are unemployed regardless of their educational experiences. So they can have a PhD and still be unemployed and a lot of them are. And it's has a lot to do with not having proper types of accommodations in the workplace. And so if we can train them on how to have meaningful skills that are useful, where they can work sometimes alone, you know, or without the pressures of particular types of deadlines, then we will be able to develop and leverage more um, of the human skill capacity that we'll need in the future. So I think that, um, Without this, we're going to have a huge uh, burden on our society just because it's fact, right? Like, and these young people will outlive their caregivers, and it's necessary to make sure that they are included in society in a way that is going to bring them, you know, money in to live a quality life uh, beyond the life of their caregivers. So, um, that's what I'm working on. And I, I teach a course right now called Exceptional Learning and Education 
And so I'm training pre-service teachers to use these type of uh, metaverse technology to be able to captivate the minds and capture and engage our students who are um, have different learning challenges. So not just autism, but ADHD and uh, dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, even students with physical limitations and disabilities, blind, deaf, deafblind, like all of those communities, we have to create accessibility in XR technology and into the metaverse and web three, because that is what real the real world looks like. And so while we want to improve upon it, we can't leave out the fact that we need to make sure that their voices are also heard in the space. Well, I have good news. Uh, Danilo Vargas, who's in the Office of Equity and Inclusion at the Office of the Mayor, is asked to uh, get introduced to you. So I'm going to um, offline make that connection. Um, you know, th they take a very broad view of inclusion, and there might be some work that you do that we can uh, apply to the largest county in Florida. So um, I'll make that connection offline, but boy, how exciting. I also um, wanted to welcome, if he's available, um, you know, I had mentioned earlier, Brian Schreiner from FIU is doing some really interesting work. Uh, Tiffany, were you able to invite him to be a panelist? He declined. <laughs> oh, he declined. Brian, you don't want to talk about what you're doing? Uh, Brian wrote, we're developing our first digital human who can communicate using AI. If Dr. Kolansky is uh, from FIU is still online, he can share more as he is our prototype. So one thing I'll share with you about Brian is, uh, so he's the Dean of CARTA, one of the largest colleges in FIU, more than 5,000 students. It's, it's essentially a, a university within a university. And um, they have been really on the cutting edge as part of their communications department of creating uh, AR, VR, augmented reality experiences. I was at the football game with him recently and you would scan a QR code and then you would get a 3D rendering, volumetric rendering of the Dean. And then you could place him on the football field like a giant uh, and you could watch the game through your phone with you know, the Dean of the school like peering over uh, the, the kids uh, playing football. So uh, just a, a very small kind of test example of some of the stuff that FIU is doing uh, to, to play with this new universe and this new world. Um, Nick, uh, Romeo, anything that you wanted to share uh, in terms of your reflections on where this is headed as a small business owner? You know, um, uh, I could honestly say, um, I think more attractions are gonna jump on it. Um, I think we're just one and, and I know when I was at the shows, people are like, hmm, we need to look into this thing. And I think I started a little stir in the community just recently, but um, I think more and more of uh, taking the opportunity that a guest could see it from their, their home, their hotel before they even arrive is going to be a huge factor for them before they book those tickets, you know, um, for their family to see what they're going to do. Um, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be great for us. Um, yeah. I'm just ahead of the ball. That's all I am. I'm ahead you, of the ball. <laughs> you know, what, what I like about your example, Nick, is you're not creating, you know, a need. You're actually solving a problem. Yep, absolutely. Um, you know, whereas a lot of the other things that I see in the metaverse feel more like, you know, at their worst gimmicks. Um, what I love about yours is it's, it feels like a better solution than loading everybody on a plane and flying them overseas and feeding them and housing them. Like what a lot of wasted time and effort mm -hmm. to achieve a relatively simple goal, which is a engaging tour of your property. And you know, another thing I could do is I have, I'm not bilingual i don't have that and i and it's hard to speak with some of these operators when i could have an avatar that's speaking spanish i could do it and they could do and now i'm talking to hundreds of people that are now i i'm they're translating for me and understanding that that attraction for me i love you know? it or so that's german a big plus or german. german or or anything italian anything so yeah. that's going to be a huge plus for us with a lot of our European operators and international operators. I love it. Well, I wanted to welcome Dr. Kolasinski uh, on, onto the stage. Hi, hi, uh, Dr. Kolasinski from FIU. How are you? You have to unmute yourself. Um, 
I understand that you are developing the first digital human who can communicate using AI and that you've been um, building out a prototype of that. Is that something you're able to, to tell us about? He might not be on, uh, he's not unmuted himself yet. Um, well, we tried, it was valiant. Uh, we are coming up uh, at the end of the hour and at the end of the uh, season. Um, so I'm gonna invite uh, Brett uh, just to give some final reflections. I wanna just remind everybody on the journey that we've been. So when we started out four weeks ago, we didn't even know what the Web3 or Metaverse or blockchain was. We hadn't heard of an NFT. We were confused and lost. And Brett uh, and our incredible guests have been our guide. We started by talking about marketing and examples of marketing in the metaverse and concrete things you can do. We then talked about the legal um, and, and financial implications of cryptocurrency and blockchain technologies. Uh, last session, we talked about how you can use this as an engagement platform uh, for employees and, and talent you're trying to recruit and also how to create a more inclusive uh, and accepting um, recruitment process that's less based on people's looks uh, and their, uh, their, their color of their skin and, 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 the, and their hair type. And then today we got, gave you three very concrete examples from very different fields, you know, a university, a, a tour operator, and a, uh, someone running meta hotels uh, in ways that today business is being done and, and, and education is happening in, in the metaverse. So, so bring us home, Brett. What are some of the biggest ahas that you've had on this four-week journey with our guests? Uh, sure, Dan. So I think that was, was a really good recap. I think we, we were able to tell a really good story. But I think it's find the most interesting, you know, I'm, I'm super, um, you know, proud of the, of the guests and that we've been able to have. So I want to thank you all. But I want to uh, reflect on the common threads that occurred in all four of our sessions, right? So I think, you know, Dr. Morris, you mentioned the, you know, the avatars, right? In our last session, um, Angela Anthony was mentioning how people could create, I, I don't remember exactly what you called it, but it was like their residual self-image in as an avatar and they would use it for interviewing for jobs because she said yeah. in the first 10 seconds of an interview, people get preconceived notions if they want to hire someone and all that goes away when you're using an avatar. So it's really interesting to me to see like common threads like that. And then when we talked about, um, you know, e-commerce and NFTs with Artifact and Nike and the shoes. And I think it's super interesting to hear Tommy build his hotel right across the street from Artifact in one of the meta worlds, right? So it's like these, get, these you know, these weeks have all been diverse. Our, our speakers have all been diverse, but there has definitely been a common thread through all four weeks that I think is, is fantastic. Yeah, and I wanna um, acknowledge Dr. Mom for giving me what I'm gonna kind of highlight as my common thread which is the term that I had never heard until today, which is falling forward. But I think that that is a beautiful description of the mindset of someone who's ready to experiment in Web3 in the metaverse. Um, I personally, Dan Gretsch, find falling forward terrifying. And I actually don't think I'm the right guy to lead the way to building the metaverse of the future. I'm just too afraid. I'm not a gambler by nature. I'm too afraid to, to, to make a mistake and fall flat on my face and lose money and lose face. Uh, I'm very comfortable being ignorant and learning. And that's why I love being in a position of a host with subject matter experts who are teaching me the way. But I just feel incredible admiration for you guys, our panelists, uh, for you, Brett, and your company, who are so courageously building the metaverse of the future. And, you know, thank God for you, Dr. Mom, because if not, that environment would have been less inclusive. Um, so as we wrap up, I, I did want to give you the last word, Dr. Mom. Um, take us home, uh, share whatever is on your mind and in your heart. This is what's so funny is the, the original term, I said, oh gosh, Dan will really be terrified if I told him what I really said. I, I really said failing forward. So if you'd heard failing, you'd have really, you'd have really been terrified. But, <laughs> but I, I love falling forward because it's a little watered down version of it. But uh, to be honest, everyone is afraid to fail. Everyone is afraid of failure, of falling 
and people being um, able to judge their journey. But this is what I can say to everyone. Baby boomers are leaving the workforce. We don't have a large generation or population of people to fill these vacant positions. It's gonna take a technologically savvy, scientifically literate society to move us forward and to be able to continue for us to live the type of conveniences that we are used to. And so we need everyone to come forward and try their hand at whatever they're good in to utilize that in allowing these technologies to grow and flourish. It can't be just done by a handful of people or one particular technological you know, company that's willing to like fall flat on their face and either in public. It's got to be built by all of us. And so I urge everyone to enjoy failing forward, learn to laugh through the process, learn a new skill set that you can use to continue to future proof our society because we're going to need more sustainable methods and people who are well versed in this area to be able to align with us so that it can grow and do what it needs to do. And let's remember that we, the human beings behind the avatars, are the most beautiful expression of how this thing is going to be built. And so if we all keep in mind that we are more connected and the same than we are different, then we can build a beautiful metaverse with free world. You know, we all look forward to falling forward with you, Dr. Mom. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. Don't let me do it alone. Do it with no. me. Well, we're, we're following thank you. So thank you guys for, for this. Thank you, Danilo and the mayor's office and Brett and Starmark for making this possible. And we'll see you guys in November for season seven. Take care, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Take care. Be safe, everyone. Bye, yes. everybody. Thank you.